in today's video. Harpagnatos, from the Greek word harp, which refers to a curved weapon such as a sickle, and gnathos, which refers to jaw, hence the sickle jaw or curved blade jaw end, but we normally call them the jumping ends. This end genus consists of 9 species, or 13 if you count the subspecies. They are only found in Asia, in the following countries. India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Malaysia, Singapore, Indonesia, and China. The genus Harpagnatus belongs to the Ponyrinae subfamily, which is notable for being different from other subfamilies of ants, because they are considered to be more primitive, meaning they have more common characteristics with their wasp ancestors. They are also known for combining simple social organization with a high diversity of morphological and behavioral traits. Harpagnatos, though they are frequently compared to Myrmecia species from Australia, are easily identifiable. Their long upward curved mandibles and remarkably large and prominent eyes with their elongated thorax instantly identify them. These ants also possess a sting which they can use for immobilizing their prey or on you if you ever tr attempt to pick them up. Their sting has been described as an acute and localized pain, followed by redness and swelling around the sting area, which tends to fade away after 30 minutes. Harpagnatus colonies, as usual in ponderine ants, tend to be small. The total number of individuals vary from a few ants to a maximum couple of hundreds. Colonies are comprised of five castes, males, queens and workers, which can then be divided into foragers, nurses and gamergates. In Harpagnatos, both queen and workers castes can reproduce sexually, but we will explain this in more detail further ahead. The life cycle of Harpagnatos from egg to adult takes around 82 days at 25 Celsius. Depending on the colony stage, eggs may take up to 30 days to hatch. Larvae take about 90 days to pupate, and pupae take about 33 days to emerge into adult ants. For the colony's first workers, it may take between 3 to 4 months for them to arrive, but by the 6th month, the colony should have 10 workers already. Regarding their lifespans, it can also vary. Adult workers can live up to 1 year, gamergates can live from 1 to 2 years while queens can live from 3 to 5 years. This variance reflects the wild versus laboratory conditions. Nest structures are one of the few elements that have been studied on both saltator and venator species. Saltator nests occur normally near the soil surface and include a more complex architecture with a variable amount of chambers stacked on top of one another whereas venator nests are more simple, with only two or three chambers, and their nests are normally found on clay embankments. Harpagnatus nest architecture is inverted. This means that the entrance is lower than the nest level, and also the ants tend to congregate on the higher chambers instead of the lower ones. The nest entrances are normally shaped as a very characteristic funnel with a 3 cm diameter. Inside the nest, chambers are divided into atrium and brood chambers. The atrium is directly connected to the entrance, and between atrium and brood chambers, the connection is made by another funnel structure. The funnel is typically about 2 cm above the floor of the atrium, and we can observe the ants needing to rear up on their hind legs to access the funnel. This type of architecture serves two purposes. First, 
it helps to prevent flooding of the brood chamber, and secondly, creates a physical obstacle to which other arthropods may not be able to overcome in case of a nest invasion. Both species have one more thing in common, which is their garbage or refuse chambers. In these humid and dark refuse chambers, we can find many types of symbiotic relationships between Harpognathus and other insects, like isopods and millipedes. In particular, the association between Venator and the millipede Glyphulus granulatus, where these scavengers help the ants get rid of their decomposing matter. Vision is very important in this genus. Harpognathus, optic lobe's volume, is only second to Gigantops destructor, a South American species, both known to forage during the daytime and catch their prey by associating vision with a jumping ability. The ability to jump has been reported for only very few ant species, and of these, the Harpognathus saltator was probably the first documented case. Overall jumping capacity has been reported as high as 2 cm and up to 10 cm long jumps. Three types of jumps have been identified in the Harpognathus case. Jumping as an escape reaction provoked by threatening situations, also called the escape jumps. Jumping as a purpose to catching prey, or also called the hunting jumps. And finally, the group jumps, where all the ants start jumping with a speculated purpose of parasite avoidance. Another very typical characteristic Harpognathus behavior is the vibrating gaster, a series of short, rapid lateral movements of the gaster where the ants are believed to be assessing the low distribution across its legs in case a jump proves necessary. Harpognathus are known to be strictly lone visual hunters which never use foraging trails. Only the older colony workers forage, while the younger ones stay in the nest tending for the brood. Their main foraging activity occurs during the early morning from 5am to 10am and in the afternoon from 16pm to 19pm. A major proportion of the prey captured were jumping or fast running insects such as isopods, arachnids, crickets and forest cockroaches. These ants hunt their prey by searching systematically below the leaf litter. When they locate their prey, they jump onto it and catch them by using their long forcep-like mandibles and paralyzing them with their venom injected through their sting. Their diet is surprisingly broad. Individual workers carry their prey items back to the nest alone. This could explain why the prey size is typically smaller than the ants are. Harpognathus primitive traits are also shown in the feeding mechanism. Harpognathus is a truly predatory ant, with workers feeding exclusively on the hemolymph of the arthropod prey item and always refusing any type of sugar and nectar diet. As we know, that type of diet only evolved later in higher ant species. Their larvae are highly mobile and are capable of tearing up their prey without the assistance of the adult ants. Adult workers of this genus do not engage in trophallaxis with their larvae, a trait shared by other ponorine species. Like we said in the beginning, in Harpognathus, both female casts reproduce sexually, but only queens are capable of dispersing and starting new colonies. Their foundation strategy is ICF, an independent colony foundation, which in this case is semi-claustral, where queens regularly leave the nest chamber to forage for food. They can be polygenous, but only one queen will be the dominant one. Once the queen dies, workers compete in a ritualized dominance tournament to decide a new group of re reproductives. This is only possible because Harpognathos workers inbreed with males that they close in their own nests. Once established, they display dominant behavioral characteristics and serve as the sole egg layers in the colony. Further attempts at reproduction by individual workers are prevented by policing nestmates because prolonged disputes about reproduction also reduce the colony productivity. 
workers are clearly able to accurately assess the ovarian activity of the nestmates and they adapt their behavior accordingly. Arpagnathos has a small queen worker dimorphism, but a distinct one. Queens can lay two eggs per day and gamergates lay one egg per day. Regarding the internal colony hierarchy, it is achieved and maintained through a series of specific behaviors. First one is dueling, which we talked about earlier, which is associated with the establishment order of new reproductives. And the second one is worker policing, which is associated with the inhibition of reproduction. For order establishment, the highly ritualized antennae tournaments involve individuals of similar status, while unilateral attacks such as biting of body parts followed by violent jerking apparently occur between reproductives whose status has already been differentiated. Regarding inhibition of reproduction, it involves biting of mated workers who have subordinate status and may be attempting to reproduce. Worker policing inhibits ovarian activity in the individual that is policed. And this is all for this week's video. I hope you have enjoyed it. To be honest, there was a lot more I could have talked about and delved into, but I really wanted to put this video out without any further delays. So if you want to know more, drop me a comment below saying what you'd like, for example a species care guide, or keeping experiences, or any other topic, and I will take care of it. Thank you very much for watching, don't forget to like, share and subscribe, I would really appreciate it, and see you all in next week's video. Bye!